So anyhow, we're ready to start tonight, and then you know, all know I went out, I think. You can <coughs> admire some of his work downstairs and also in a room upstairs. And he's accompanied by a friend, jazz musician, <coughs> Bob Antolin. That's where you're from. Yes. So I will let you talk about Bob since I don't know much about him. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks to Francine and the staff for being such gracious hosts and letting me view this here. Um, I got the idea for doing this because a lot of the uh, a lot of the work is inspired by initial experience with. Uh, music, landscape, or people. Um, I'll just read you a short little statement I wrote for the show to give you some idea. When you hear music after it's over, it's gone in the air. You can never capture it again. That's um, jazz musician Eric Dolphy's uh, quote. If only we knew landscapes from the sound of memory. Back in the 1970s, I spent some time in Japan. I would have a few jobs teaching English throughout the week, but beyond that, the rest of the time was my own. One of my small pleasures was the jazz coffee shop, where for the price of one cup of coffee, one would sit for hours immersed in the music. Each coffee shop uh, would have massive, comprehensive collections of jazz albums from Japan and imported air, air mail from Europe and the US, mining the specific interests of each owner. I was literally educated and exposed to such an encyclopedia on the history of jazz while engaged in the simple act of sipping a cup of coffee. The cherry on top of a Sunday for me was that you could request music. The master or owner dutifully cataloged their entire collection for you to see. You could skim through this massive tune, then tell the server what you wanted to hear. When each record was played, they would take the album jacket out and put it on display for anyone who was curious. When I look back on it, I'm ever so grateful for these tiny havens of sound still lodged in my memory. It may be true that music is a fleeting, spontaneous moment in time, not likely to be repeated, yet these personal landscapes serve as maps, if you will, a way to lead me back to initial experiences that influenced my life. These encounters with music, people, and nature still resonate. And thank you for sharing the journey tonight. Um, I'd like to dedicate this reading to uh, Jim Leong, a painter friend who passed away last week. And uh, also to uh, Kiku Dewa, a textile artist uh, who once had a shop uh, on Finney across the street. And, uh, so, the first piece I'm going to read tonight is a, a tribute I wrote for Kiku. We had a memorial for her at uh, Kobo. Um, and I wrote this uh, uh, piece for her. And there, also I did, for some reason, I had a couple hours to kill. And I did a couple paintings for Kiku as well, which are in the show. <coughs> These plum blossoms falling where they will in the garden, or the crinkle of onion skins, remembering Kiku. Flashback to Q. 
Kyoto City in the early 1970s. I pulled myself out from under my kotatsu from where I must have fallen asleep, hiding from the cold in this three and a half mat tatami room with no heat. Barely getting on a tie, I run for the streetcar. The screeching jerk of the tension on the tracks as the conductor navigates a turn around Karasuma Dori jolts me from my slumber. I am late again for my 7 a.m. English conversation class <laughs> at Kyoto UNESCO on Teramachi Dori. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a thin Japanese man with shoulder-length silver hair, face partially hidden under the brim of a sombrero. Dressed in a traditional striped kimono and wearing geta, he holds a Hogan's Heroes lunchbox in one hand. In the other, a long tapered bag full of plum blossoms flowers and grasses that wouldn't look out of place in Frida Kahlo's hair. Later, a Japanese friend would tell me that who I saw was a famous local flower arrangement teacher known for his unorthodox teaching methods. <laughs> Thinking of this pop culture fashion plate, I'm reminded of Kiku. But if you ever saw Kiku in a room, it would never be such a jarring clash of flashy elements. If anything, Kiku was tasteful. One would first notice the thread the texture, the line, and the material, and how each element would blend in harmony and yet still be striking. All the way up to her carefully positioned beret, and all the way down to the shoelaces on her shoes. I'm reminded of a Japanese garden where each element is impeccably designed and set. The rake sand and gravel, the stones carefully placed, the manicured shrubbery and trees all calibrated to pacify yet stimulate one's consciousness simultaneously. Then out of the corner of your eye, you notice the color of fallen plum blossoms swept across the clay wall. And the silence is pierced by the joyous squeals of children filling the air from the elementary school next door. The spontaneous unexpected movements of life splashed across a carefully stretched blank canvas. I can't remember when we first met, Kiku. Was it when you came to the opening of the show I had at a gallery? Or was it when you came in one morning when I was working the produce rack at a watching on it. I remembered you because though customers asked me for many things, no one ever asked me for the blonde brown shells of onion skins. Shed in a pile display case, 
crinkling away while customers sorted them out. When I asked you what you were going to do with them, you told me you needed them for their color to dye fabric. And that got me to thinking, what color would these onion skins produce? The earthy brown minerals of soil bled from scrub gobo? The fine autumn hue of chestnuts still clinging to their leaves and prickled hair? The muddy river of a yosenabe bubbling full of mushrooms, greens, and vegetables? Or the cloudy murk of broth stained by simmering New Year's soba? Or was it the sweet, dark, sticky glue of azuki bean simmering in sugar, then buried in the golden powder of kinako? Kiku grew up in the Kyoto neighborhood Nishijin, an area famous for producing the silk for traditional kimono. I lived there for a time, rooming illegally with Doshisha University students. The click and clack of their mahjong pieces into the night would compete with the repetitive shuttle of looms filling the back streets. My wife's father labored here too carefully sorting lines and colors of thread for the looms. The tradition of art and textile was in Kiku's blood, down to every finger of her sturdy hands, passed on from generation to generation. But it was in America where she took that tradition and made it anew. Kiku, when I revisit these poems by the wandering monk Satoka again, I think of you too, where the walls are falling apart, the vines, the grass, men, women, and the shadows too. The waves sound sometimes close and sometimes far away. How much more life 